Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, today I'm going to cover Mirabegron. Uh, the brand name of this medication is Merbitric. And it is important to note that this medication at this time still is a brand name medication. So uh, whenever you deal with patients that are you need to use or want to use a brand name medication, you have to have the expectation that it's going to be very expensive. Uh, and in our medical system, uh, it may or may not be covered by insurance initially. So uh, that's always a, a big, big challenge. And I think a lot of healthcare professionals don't understand uh, at least what the cash price for a lot of these medications are. So uh, just to, to give you an example of uh, Merbitric here as a brand name medication, uh, the cost ballpark is in the range of $300 to $500 a month. And so that's substantially significant. And you know any patient that's taking uh, this type of medication, that always has to be part of our assessment. So I just wanted to, to lay out that point because it is so important when it comes to uh, patient adherence uh, to recognize that cost plays a huge, huge role. And depending upon that patient's uh, insurance, how well they're able to afford that medication, uh, they may be rationing it, they may be uh, skipping days on purpose, they may be um, using that in an a non-approved or inappropriate way that might make that medication uh, less effective. So you just have to have to recognize when you're working with patients to ask those questions about the cost of medications and if they can uh, afford medications. So getting into that, getting over that little rant there, let's get into the pharmacology of the drug and actually how the drug works. So its classification, it is a beta-3 agonist. And you may remember beta receptors from thinking about beta blockers to other beta agonists. And the really important point about beta receptors is there's multiple subtypes of those receptors. So the three main subtypes of beta receptors where we have drug targets are beta 1, 2, and 3. So 1, those subtype of receptors are typically found uh, in the heart, for example. Beta 2 are on the lungs, and beta 3, at least as far as drug targets go, uh, are primarily found uh, in the bladder urinary tract system. Now, mechanistically, how this drug works, that beta-3 receptor activation or that agonist activity, it allows for the bladder smooth muscle to relax. And when that bladder smooth muscle relax, or relaxes, this allows for a greater capacity, greater ability to store urine. So this means that those muscles, they aren't constricting, they aren't contracting. And when you have that constriction and contraction, the patient, what they're going to experience likely is that sensation for going to the bathroom. So as you could imagine, this medication is used to manage uh, overactive bladder symptoms, urge incontinence type symptoms. Now, I did mention the cost as being an important factor when it comes to uh, reviewing and assessing patient adherence to medications. Uh, one other important factor is dosing. If you've got a, a medication that needs to be dosed multiple times per day, the more often you have to dose that medication, the more likely it is that patients are going to have a difficult time following that regimen. Now, with Mirabegron, uh, it is an extended release product, and dosing is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. So we've either got 25 milligrams or 50 milligrams once a day. Uh, the one uh, kind of major exception is uh, there is an adjustment in patients with uh, creatinine clearance, 15 to 30 mils per minute. Uh, max recommended dose there is, is 25 milligrams. If we've got patients on dialysis, patients with 
uh, creatinine clearance less than 15 mils per minute is recommended to avoid uh, the use of this medication. Uh, one important point about that administration. So overactive bladder, urge incontinence, uh, frequency, this is typically going to be a problem in your geriatric patient population for the most part. And it's important to remember that as we age, uh, we may not be able to uh, swallow medications quite as well as we used to. That may be an issue. Uh, I've definitely run into to patients that are, you know, crushing medications and, and mixing it in stuff. Uh, they're chewing up their pills actually in, in their mouth. And it's important to, to make sure we're assessing that as well. Because something like Mirabegron, uh, this is a medication that you're, you're not supposed to split, chew, crush, because it is an extended release uh, formulation. So be sure to assess that uh, with patients that you might think have uh, that borderline capacity or ability uh, to be able to uh, swallow a, a pill whole, for example. Adverse effect profile. So when I think about a drug that... Uh, can act on beta receptors, we've always got this potential for working on some of those other beta receptors. So in the setting where a patient uh, is maybe on the higher dose, for example, or for whatever reason, uh, that beta-3 agonist is activating some of those beta-1 and, and beta-2 receptors, I specifically, as far as adverse effect profile goes, think more of the, the beta-1 activation. So beta-1 agonist activity, the potential ramifications from that are increase in blood pressure and increase in pulse. So it's important to recognize that mirabegron, as a dose-dependent factor, may increase blood pressure and may increase uh, heart rate. Okay, so very, very important to remember that. And when we go from that 25 milligrams up to that 50 milligrams, it's definitely going to be more likely to happen uh, at that higher dose. So very important to, to recognize the pharmacology behind that, to understand the differences between, you know, beta 1, 2, and, and 3 receptors, and what uh, blockade does versus agonist uh, activity there. Another thing to, to keep in mind, um, if we kind of relax that, that bladder smooth muscle, uh, sometimes these uh, medications or, or mirabegrons used in combination with uh, other urinary anticholinergics. So keep an eye out for patients who may have uh, urinary retention or be at risk for urinary retention. So uh, if they have you know, frequent stones, for example, uh, that's probably a more rare case. More commonly, if they have something like BPH, that's going to block that bladder outlet or potentially uh, at least inhibit, uh, reduce the potential for um, bladder outflow. And the drug, Mirabegron, uh, in combination with anticholinergics as well, could potentially worsen that and worsen symptoms of urinary retention. So let's take a quick break from our sponsor here, and I'll finish up on drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material, We've got BCMTMS, we've got BCPS, BCACP, as well as BCGP uh, study material. Definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. We also have links to uh, free audiobooks. If you've never had an audiobook from audible.com, uh, they have a, a special promotion where you can absolutely get your first one for free. So I've got links there as well at meded101.com slash store. We also have books on Amazon, uh, NAPLEX study material, a whole host of clinical resources uh, for nurse practitioners, med students, uh, PA students, um, and all, all different types of healthcare professionals uh, who have to. Uh, understand uh, what medications can do and how they uh, can impact patients. So you can go check out those resources, help support the sponsor, help support our podcast. Uh, go to meded101.com slash store and uh, check out all our resources there. 
With drug interactions, it's important to note that Mirabegron is a six, excuse me, a CYP two D six inhibitor. Okay, so this is going to cause a lot of potential for drug interactions, particularly drugs that uh, are impacted by uh, alterations in the function of CYP two D six. So CYP two D six, it's an enzyme that breaks down certain drugs and or converts them into active metabolites. Now, the first three drug interactions I want to mention, so tamoxifen, tramadol, and codeine. These are all drugs that are actually activated by CYP2D6. So, if you use Mirabegron, if that's on board, and you start tamoxifen or you're using tamoxifen, Mirabegron, by inhibiting CYP2D6, is going to prevent the formation of the active metabolite of tamoxifen. What does that mean in layman's terms? You're going to have reduced effects from that tamoxifen. Now, obviously, tamoxifen being used in breast cancer, uh, that's potentially a big problem. So you've got to be aware of that when we're thinking about using uh, this medication. Tramadol and codeine. Uh, codeine I don't see used terribly often anymore. Um, tramadol I do see a, a fair amount still. Um, those drugs also have active metabolites, and those active metabolites are created uh, by the activity of CYP2D6. So again, Mirabegron on board, you're going to experience uh, reduced analgesic effects from tramadol and codeine, or at least that's the potential. Now, it's dose dependent and uh, all, you know, may depend upon other medications and, and things of that nature too. Um, but in general, uh, that's likely what's going to, to happen. Now, we also have numerous drugs that are active that are broken down and turned into inactive drugs by CYP2D6. So with Mirabegron inhibiting CYP2D6, we can actually uh, prolong the effects of certain drugs and increase the you know, clinical effectiveness and or increase the risk of toxicity if we've got higher concentrations. So there are some classic uh, psych medications in particular uh, that are broken down. Uh, at least in part, by CYP2D6. Uh, clozapine, an antipsychotic, aripiprazole, haloperidol, more antipsychotics. Uh, we've got a couple um, antidepressants, for example, uh, fluoxetine, paroxetine. Those are also broken down by CYP2D6. So again, by using Mirabegron, we're more likely to have higher concentrations and increased risk of toxicity. One other, one final drug interaction I want to wrap up with here is, in theory, uh, the beta agonist activity, again, particularly maybe at higher doses of Mirabegron, that can oppose uh, the effects of beta blockers. So your metoprolols, your propranolols, atenolols, and so on, uh, in theory, uh, that definitely could happen. So that is something that I would uh, look out for. Again, we're going to probably monitor heart rate and monitor pulse uh, to ensure that the, the medications are, are working effectively there. But again, when you give a beta agonist and the patient's on a beta blocker, if we've you know not hitting those receptor subtypes perfectly, uh, there is some potential that effects uh, could be blunted there. So I think that's going to wrap it up for today. I've got that free resource at reallifepharmacology.com. It's a 31-page PDF. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, nursing students, uh, pharmacy technician students, uh, pharmacy students, uh, and lots of other uh, students, healthcare students who have to take pharmacology, take advantage of that resource. I really highlight super important stuff. Uh, that you'll likely uh, probably find on varying board exams uh, as well as pharmacology and exams throughout college. So definitely go uh, check that out absolutely for free for subscribing uh, to the podcast where we 
uh, shoot you out emails when we've got a, a new podcast available there. So go check out that free resource. If you enjoy the podcast, if you find it beneficial, helpful, uh, leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, also, you know, shoot out an email uh, to your class. We've we've grown exponentially uh, because of your guys' support and sharing the the podcast uh, with your friends, with your classmates. Or if you're you know a professor and you have students, uh, definitely uh, send them our way and uh, give them a little uh, extra education in, in addition to to what they're getting in the the classroom there. So I'm going to sign off for today. Thanks so much for listening. You can track me down on LinkedIn as well as uh, hit the contact button at reallifepharmacology.com. You can shoot me an email there if you have questions, suggestions, and all that uh, good stuff. So Eric Christensen signing off. Uh, Thanks so much for listening. Take care and have a great rest of your day.